Hello, and welcome to Great.com Talks With. Today, we're talking with John Huckabee, CEO of AIDS Foundation Houston, an organization whose mission is to end the HIV epidemic in the Houston area. And if you're new to our podcast, please press subscribe button either on YouTube or your podcast app, because today we're going to learn about an organization that envisions community where HIV is stigma-free and rare, and people have equitable access to care. Hello, John. Welcome to Great.com Talks. We're excited to have you here. Hi, Kareem. Thank you for having me today. Wonderful. Uh, could you please describe AIDS Foundation Houston for someone who is not familiar with your work? Sure. AIDS Foundation Houston is a, uh, a nonprofit um, organization, non-governmental organization, uh, uh, incorporated in the state of Texas here in the U.S. And we were founded in 1982, so about one year after the first reported cases of HIV in the United States. And as you mentioned, we have one focus and we've had this focus for 39 years and that's to bring the HIV epidemic to an end. We are a um, very passionate and culturally diverse group of 59 staff members. We have 19 board members and hundreds of volunteers who share our passion for this work. Uh, we focus our efforts on those individuals who are most likely to be out of care, right? So those individuals, for example, um, exiting incarceration, those individuals experiencing housing insecurity or homelessness, food insecurity, uh, lack of income or employment opportunities, those facing stigma and fear and discrimination and uh, systemic racism. Uh, young people uh, under the age of 25 who are uh, more likely to be out of care um, than older individuals, right? So we focus our efforts on making sure that everyone is reached so that we can achieve that vision of equitable access because the only way that we're going to end the HIV epidemic is if everybody has equitable access to health care and support services. Mm -hmm. The fact that you have been running, um, AIDS Foundation Houston has been running for 39 years and you have been in the front line and know all the uh, challenges that people are living with HIV and AIDS face and you know what kind of care they need as well as uh, what kind of support system they need. And based on that, you have built around an organization that is directed um, to solving the issues, that is directed to providing um, efficient help and making, as you mentioned, uh, having everyone equitable access to care is very, very important. For someone uh, who is not familiar with HIV epidemic uh, and AIDS epidemic uh, history, could you please tell us um, uh, uh, just a brief uh, introduction into HIV and AIDS diseases and uh, what cycle of improvements have been made in the last 40 years since the, uh, the first case uh, was recognized in the United States? Yes. Uh, so HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. So it is a viral agent uh, that uh, is uh, transmissible uh, in very particular ways, right? So unlike COVID-19, for example, it, this is not an airborne pathogen, right? So the, uh, the prevention efforts are very different. You know, traditional, uh, most common modes of transmission are through sexual intercourse, uh, through injection drug use where needles are shared. Uh, so it, it's blood to blood or it's body fluid um, exchange. This is how a person can acquire HIV. And, and what HIV being a virus, a, retro, um, a, a retrovirus does is when it enters the body, it uh, generally attacks the immune system of the body, which is why we, we call AIDS acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, right? Because it is acquired from outside the body. It's not an autoimmune um, issue. And it attacks the immune system. And so what that does and what we saw in the 80s and 90s is it opens the individual up then to a whole series of other infections that we call opportunistic infections, 
that, so you have your immune system being attacked, unable to fight off disease. And then that opens the gateway for other infections to further um, deteriorate health. And of course, back in the 80s and 90s, it was often fatal, right? So this is basically uh, uh, how uh, HIV works. Uh, we have about, here in the US, we have about 38 million individuals currently living with HIV. We have about 1 million new HIV cases every year in the United States. Uh, so that's just a, a brief overview of HIV. Some of the things that's changed are, of course, in the area of prevention. So we have now two very effective uh, drugs that help to prevent the acquisition of HIV, um, and they are called Truvada and Descovy. And these two drugs are once a day pills, right? And so if a person who is vulnerable to HIV is on one of these drugs, we call it PrEP, right? Pre-exposure prophylaxis or prevention. If someone is on this drug and takes this drug once a day, uh, and therefore keeps that level of the drug in the system, they are up to 99% reduction in risk of acquiring HIV. We didn't have that drug 25 years ago when I started in the field, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is a very, uh, since 2012, uh, this is a very new uh, advancement in the prevention front with regard to HIV. One of the things we wanna say about PrEP drugs though is, they don't prevent pregnancy and they don't prevent sexually transmitted infections. And this is very important because the, uh, the presence of a sexually transmitted infection such as syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia can make it easier to acquire HIV. So we want to make sure that, we, that while we are celebrating the importance of PrEP, that it should be used in accompaniment with uh, condoms, right? So that you have the ultimate uh, protection. So that's a huge advance on the prevention side. On the treatment side, I mean, obviously we have come a long, long way. Uh, now a treatment for HIV uh, can be as simple as a single pill once a day, uh, which is highly effective at reducing the amount of virus in the body. Now, this is important too, because the science has shown that if a person who's living with HIV is able to reduce the amount of virus in the body to such a low level that it's not detectable on a standard viral load test, then that person is unable to transfer HIV to another person through sex. So that is a huge advancement, not only for the person living with HIV to build up their immune system, to ward off all those other infections, to live a healthy life, but also to know that they can rest at peace knowing that I'm not gonna transfer HIV to my loved one. So viral suppression is very important. And we call that U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. And what that means is that if a person living with HIV has a viral load that is undetectable, that equals the inability to transmit HIV to another. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, John, for telling us um, the brief um, history of HIV and AIDS and also um, how improvements were made in the prevention as well as the treatment of the HIV. The fact that uh, now a person can uh, take uh, either one of the one of the two available PrEP drugs and can have a um, safety net of 99% and whereas a person who has HIV and is taking uh, treatment if they are undetectable it's untrans uh, untransmissible, untransmittable. So the, um, the stigma that was around uh, HIV and the AIDS, uh, if we take it the history 30 to 40 years ago, now um, it's, uh, uh, it's safer and people uh, with HIV can live a longer life and they're not um, dangerous at all to uh, society.
Um, what challenges do people living with HIV and fa- AIDS, AIDS uh, f- uh, face today? And what kind of support system do they need as you are working uh, directly uh, with such individuals? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and I do want to pick up on that idea that you mentioned, Kareem, about stigma, right? So depending upon where one is in the world, stigma can very much still be a barrier to testing and to getting care uh, or to getting prep, right? And so, for example, here in the United States, one out of every seven people people who are living with HIV don't know that they're living with HIV. Now, that's a problem on two fronts. One, that individual is missing an opportunity to receive the treatments that can keep them healthy. Uh, Number two, that person can be transferring HIV to another, right? Um, totally unbeknownst to them, right? Because they don't know that they're living with HIV. So this is one of the real challenges with something that's been around for 39 years, you know, 40 years now. We don't have a cure. We don't have a vaccine yet, right? Very effective prevention medication, very effective treatment medications, but no cure, no vaccine. So it's the understanding that HIV is not over, right? And that we have to continue to inform and educate around the importance of knowing one's status, right? Well, that's all fine and good, but if I'm afraid to go to my doctor and have that conversation, if I am worried about someone seeing me in a place where it is known that HIV tests are done, right? or if I am reticent to ask for a sexually transmitted infection screening to see if I am living with a sexually transmitted infection, then I'm missing that opportunity, right? So that fear of approaching a medical professional is a challenge. Um, The stigma of, uh, for example, a person who is transgender asking their physician, for gender affirming care, right? Asking their physician for an HIV screen. Uh, Women uh, asking their physician or gynecologist for uh, an HIV screen. Um, Sometimes, and in some places that can evoke the question of why do you need that screen? What, you know, it's almost a a sort of a, a judgment thing. Well, why do you need that? Or what are you doing that makes you think you need that? Well, unfortunately, that kind of messaging is very harmful because it keeps people from knowing their status and receiving the proper care. So stigma is huge, whether it's cultural, religious, societal, political, whatever those norms are that create um, a fear or a judgment around people for seeking care is very damaging. And so part of that is normalizing the conversation, training healthcare providers to talk with their patients, all of their patients around an HIV screen, um, as well as working with um, political influencers, social influencers, uh, religious leaders, to help them to understand and to have more information uh, that can help to reduce uh, stigma and fear. That is one of the big challenges that we as providers face, but also the individual who's thinking about their healthcare, who's thinking about their life, you know, to have a safe space where they can go in and have a very frank conversation about what it is they feel they need and what they feel is their risk. Mm -hmm. It's very unfortunate that the stigma still exists and it creates barriers uh, for individuals to get tested and get care, um, the one that they need and uh, be uh, cautious and just uh, 
openly talk about it. You mentioned that uh, many people feel pressure based on uh, their uh, societal norms, based on cultural, based on political norms. Yet the conversation is very important. The more people are educated, the more they are aware of the risks and the, the more they are aware of the care and the more uh, we can um, overcome the barriers and obstacles that are being created in uh, around HIV stigma. Um, as your organization, earlier we talked that uh, you work with uh, youth and incarcer incarcerated uh, um, individuals who uh, require housing. Could you please tell us about your supportive housing program? Sure. And, and one thing I would just add from what we were just discussing is, is this. To someone who may be watching our time together today. If you have felt the need to have an HIV test, but have for whatever reason put it off, uh, I encourage you to get that test. Because even if it turns out that you are living with HIV and have been living with HIV for some time, the medications we have now are very good and they can reverse that course. Uh, if, you, if you have a high viral load, the medications today can bring that down and bring that down quickly and really help you. So just want to encourage you, if you're watching or listening today and you haven't made that decision, it's not too late. So um, we do a lot of work in the area of housing, and we've done that since day one. Our first housing program opened in 1982. Uh, we currently have six supportive housing programs for people living with HIV. Why do we spend so much time on housing when HIV is a medical illness, right? Well, the reason is because so much of what drives health outcomes does not happen in the clinic. It happens outside the clinic. And if a person is struggling financially, if they're struggling with food insecurity, if they don't have a stable place to live, or if the place where they're living is really not suitable for habitation, it's going to be very difficult for individuals to focus on their health care, right? So for us, being able to provide a stable housing solution is really important for those most vulnerable in our communities. And think about people coming out of incarceration. It can be very difficult to find someone who will allow you to lease from them, for example. For persons without a stable income, it can be very difficult to get approved for a lease, even for a rental, right? So you have these social determinants of health. That's where we focus. And housing is the biggest one. And, and there's a reason for that. And the reason is the science. If a person living with HIV's goal is to get to sustained viral suppression, that is with the medications to bring HIV down in the body so that you can be healthy, the research shows that those most vulnerable to being out of care and not virally suppressed are those who are housing unstable, right? So we have six housing programs. We provide the full range of opportunities. We have housing specifically for women and trans women. We have housing for families where someone is affected, where one person is living with HIV. We have housing for individuals and couples. We have housing for young people under the age of 25. Uh, we have a housing program specifically for people coming out of incarceration. So we do lots of supportive housing for that very reason. We want equitable access for all because that's how you end the HIV epidemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing um, the fact that um, how the absence of the stable housing 
um, is the largest barrier to getting equitable access and your organization is uh, working to overcome that barrier to make sure that uh, the most vulnerable uh, members of this uh, community of HIV community who require housing and who require stable um, roof, uh, stable roof, they are getting uh, that first uh, help uh, from um, your organization and the partnerships um, that you have. Besides housing, you also uh, help um, the community uh, with a range of support services. Could you please tell us uh, about those support services uh, in detail as well? Thank you. I appreciate that, Kareem. Uh, you know, what we do, we do in partnership with a whole lot of other people, right? And so that's how it, that's how it works. That's how our community comes together and galvanizes toward a cause. We receive funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, directly and through the City of Houston Health Department to provide high impact HIV prevention and testing campaigns. We test over 1200 people in the Houston area every year uh, for HIV and sexually transmitted infections. We also have a collaboration with a group called Mr. M-I-S-T-R dot com. Hey, Mr. dot com is the website. And what that does is that allows an individual to go online and register to receive an HIV kit at home, do the test at home, send it off to the lab, no postage, uh, receive the result through a video consult with a physician. And if the individual is negative for HIV, they have the option right there to receive a script for PrEP and have it delivered to their home. So we, we offer that as an option for people who, for whatever reason, are not comfortable or not able to come into our clinic, right? So we, we test in the community. We test at the bars. We test at the community events. We test at partner locations. We test in our own clinic, and we test at home. Mm -hmm. uh, because again, the goal is that everyone knows their status, right? So that they can take the, the proper action. We also do a lot of work inside the Texas prison system. Very strong collaboration with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. They allow us to come in and train persons who are incarcerated to become peer educators. So we train them and then they train their peers throughout the uh, prison system. When persons living with HIV who are get, getting ready to be released, we provide discharge case management for them. And we also navigate them into the healthcare system here in the Houston area. And we provide, as I mentioned, a housing program with some wraparound services uh, for them. We provide uh, PrEP pre-exposure prophylaxis to 400 people every month. No cost sharing on the part of the individual. We want to make it as affordable and accessible as possible. We do all the labs. We do all the doctor visits. The patient doesn't pay. And they receive the drugs at no cost through the generosity of the drug maker uh, if they don't have any insurance. Uh, supportive housing programs serve over 250 persons each month. Um, and all the wraparound, the case management, the mental health care, the uh, patient navigation into care, the uh, referrals for job training and placement. We even do a summer camp for kids, right? So uh, children ages 7 to 16 who are living with HIV get a chance to have that summer camp experience that maybe they might not have otherwise been able to have, right? At no cost to them or their families. Um, every summer, uh, we partner with Camp for All, a local nonprofit camp provider, a low barrier camp, welcomes persons with disabilities and all, and all conditions. We have our week reserved every summer, and we bring in children living with HIV, not only from Houston and Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, but from Oklahoma and Arkansas and Louisiana and all over, right? And they all come together and they spend a week being kids and enjoying summer camp. And what we know happens from that is not only the social and emotional support for the young people living with HIV, 
But we also see medication adherence begin to go up after camp. Because again, the, the experience of taking the daily meds becomes normalized and it's, it's easier to transition back home and to remember to take those meds. So it's a very, it's a, um, this is our 26th year doing camp and it's a very good way to start early with our young persons living with HIV to understand the concepts of U equals U or how taking my meds can help me protect myself and others, you know, as they grow older. Mm. It's great that you offer comprehensive support systems, whether it's a testing, whether it's a preventional, whether uh, it's a drug support, as well as the, you work closely with the prison system on uh, making sure that incarcerated people have um, enough awareness about HIV and you train uh, peers that can uh, further uh, share their knowledge uh, with the rest of the community and you help prepare them once um, they are uh, out of incarceration to uh, build back um, into the lifestyle, as well as you mentioned, working together with the kids and making, building a society, building a community from the young age and educating them on uh, on the matters of the importance of the treatment and uh, just the uh, basic uh, understanding. Um, that's very, very important. If someone would like to support AIDS Foundation Houston, how can they do that? Well, we welcome them. Um, People can support us in a number of ways. Uh, one way is to volunteer with us, right? Um, our website is www.aidshelp.org. That's A-I-D-S-H-E-L-P dot org. They can volunteer with us. They can make a financial gift to us. They can uh, join one of our events that we hold each year, our annual walk, our annual World AIDS Day commemorative luncheon. Uh, we have other events throughout the year that they can support directly. They can uh, make a gift from their company and ask their company to match their gift. Many companies do that. Um, they, they can invite uh, colleagues from their company to come do a volunteer project. That happens very often. There are lots of ways to support the mission. If not everybody can spend 100% of their time focused on ending HIV, we're fortunate to be able to do that. But we know that others cannot, but they want to support the cause. They want to see HIV come to an end. And these are just some of the ways that they can do that. And all of that information is on the website, aidshelp.org. Mm -hmm. The link to the AIDS Foundation Houston's website will be provided in the description. So you viewing and listening uh, can go to the website and familiarize yourself with all the projects John and the team at AIDS Foundation Houston are doing and support them in their mission of ending HIV epidemic in the Houston area. Thank you so much, John. It was wonderful to get to know you and the great work your organization is doing. Thank you for having us on. And Kareem, thank you all for the work you're doing to help get the word out about this cause and so many important causes that you all are passionate about. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you. For you listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, please press like and share button because this will show the YouTube and podcast algorithm that this conversation is important. We need to create a community where HIV is stigma-free and rare. Thank you and see you in the next episode.